We're going to do a quick fire round of questions now where we're looking, Treasurer, for some, not from talking points and not from briefing documents, but <laughs> quick yes, no or short answers. We'll take a question from Bilal Mazafa. So the rise of Rishi Sunak as Prime Minister in the UK is a moment to celebrate the evolving diversity in UK politics. Will we see a Prime Minister of colour here in our lifetime? Yes. Uh, we've just elected the most uh, diverse intake of new MPs on the Labor side nationally uh, in the history of this country. Uh, and, you know, I, I have been spending time uh, with the Sally Situs and the Zanita Mascarenas and uh, Fatima Payman and all of these absolutely unbelievable uh, new representatives from very diverse communities. I have absolutely no doubt uh, that we will see a Prime Minister from, of colour in my lifetime. Do they have to line up behind you? Is it something you, you'd like to see? They can, they can line up in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> Political answer. Here's Jeremy Gray. Currently 3.3 million Australians live below the poverty line. Will the government commit to ending poverty or does it believe that poverty is acceptable? No, I don't think uh, anyone can believe that poverty is acceptable. Uh, and uh, if it was an easy challenge to address, we would have fixed it by now. Uh, you've got to chip away at a problem of that magnitude. I think housing is a big part of the story. I talked about that already. Uh, and there are other ways that we can support uh, families and people doing it tough. Uh, and as a Labor government, we are always looking for opportunities to do more. Uh, we don't want to ever uh, give people false hope. Uh, that you can just click your fingers and make poverty disappear, uh, but you can commit to work away at alleviating it and eliminating it, and that's what we do. Isn't there a structural issue here, though, because we are seeing now that intergenerational poverty is becoming embedded, that privilege is embedded, that the rich are getting richer, they're going to get richer even during an inflationary cycle because they're earning more on what they've got saved away, and they're passing that on to their children. At what point do we have to get serious about taxing inheritance, about looking at intergenerational wealth? Well, I mean, I want to make it clear. Uh, we, we're not contemplating uh, an inheritance tax or anything that looks like that. What, what, uh, why not, though? I mean, they, they've got a round of applause yeah. and we know that it, is, that it is embedded. We talked about our own situations and our children are going to be better because they're going to inherit from us. Other people are not going to have that. Why not? I think other that, countries do. I think that there are other ways uh, to make the tax system fairer uh, and to generate this kind of intergenerational mobility that we want to see. Uh, and, you know, we made a start on that on budget night, you know, taxing... Uh, multinationals differently, tax compliance measures, some other measures in the budget. Uh, and we need to continue to work away at that front, on that front. Uh, I think we can make this tax system fairer. Uh, I just don't want to give you the sense that we're going to act on that particular one because we're not. A video now from Peter Pepin. Labor promised a reduction in power prices of $275 by 2025. How is this calculated? given the uncertain current economic times. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Well, the, the truth is it was calculated uh, from modelling in 2021. Uh, and you're right to allude in your question to the fact that a lot has happened since then. Uh, and if you think about uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, which a lot of people anticipated would be a two or three week mm. affair, uh, has become something that's lasted many months. Uh, and the pressure on global energy markets has intensified really substantially. And so that $275 figure uh, was from modelling done in 2021, and it was about an outcome in 2025. And in 2022, we've got a war in Europe, uh, which is pushing up prices for everyone. Sounds like you're saying now you can't deliver on that. 275, you can't deliver on that. Well, what I'm saying is we need to recognise the reality. We don't know in 2022, uh, what the impact of the war in Ukraine is going to be on a 2025 outcome. That's just to level with people. Uh, it remains the fact, and the modelling that we're talking about in 2021, it remains the fact that the cheapest new sources of energy are renewable energy, is renewable energy. Uh, that's still the case. Uh, but I don't think we can ignore the fact that when the modelling was done in 2021 and an outcome in 2025, 
we've got this enormous event which has changed substantially the outlook for energy prices, not just in Australia but around the world. The war in Ukraine was underway during the election and you were still promising it. Um, but at 275, you're saying now you can't deliver on that. You can't be certain that you will deliver on that, on that number. Well, we don't know what the situation will be in 2025, but the point that you made at the start of your question, I think I need to pull up, which is even though the war was happening when the election was on, most people, including experts that spend their whole professional lives monitoring these things, thought the war would be over quickly and they, under, they underestimated the impact on energy pipelines and all of that. And so I, I think it is self-evident uh, that a longer war in Europe uh, with a more intense impact on global energy markets is going to impact us here. Yeah, there go a whole lot of projections, but we'll come to that. Let's hear from Anam Khan. The budget paints a pretty bleak outlook. Should we be prepared for a recession? Yeah, thanks, Anam. I, I don't think so. Uh, certainly not the Treasury's expectation in their forecasts uh, that we will go that way. Uh, but Europe will, you know, UK will. Uh, other countries are at risk as well, and we won't be completely immune from, from that. You know, when the global economy turns down substantially, as it did uh, you know, almost 15 years ago, as it did a couple of years ago, you know, we can't completely escape the consequences of that. But our expectation uh, is that we will avoid a recession. Our economy will slow substantially next year, quite substantially as a consequence of the global downturn, the impact of higher interest rates and some other issues as well. And so my view about the economy is I am really quite optimistic about the future of our economy and the future of our country. But over the next six or 12 or 18 months, we are in for some very tricky terrain uh, from a global point of view and, and, and we will feel the impact here. But if Europe is, the United States is skating very close to that, dropping down to about 1% growth. You're forecasting 1.5% the second half of next year. That's getting perilously close. If we keep seeing interest rates go up, unemployment starts to edge up, people stop spending, we know that's going to have an impact. So what you're saying right now to the answer to that question is you don't know, do you, whether we'll go into recession or not. You're hoping, but you don't know. Well, what I'm saying is that I don't expect us to go into recession. Uh, and if your point is that uh, things can change, of course they can. Uh, and the biggest risk is actually if we let inflation get out of control and interest rates have to chase higher and higher inflation, uh, then that makes, as the Reserve Bank Governor said a couple of nights ago, that makes a, re a recession more likely here, but it's not our expectation. Mm. Our last quick fire question, and it comes from Conrad Mikowski. Just a quick either or. What would you rather? Everyone earning more than 180k a year receive an $8,000 bonus each year, or free university education and dental in Medicare. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a multiple choice. Well, I think on education, I think our HEX system works pretty well. Uh, and I know that's not your view, I can tell by your reaction. Well, he's, uh, he's, he's, is... paying a, he's paying back a debt while inflation's going up. Yeah, understood. Uh, I think the HEX system works relatively well. Uh, if your question is, can we make the tax system fairer, I think we can. Uh, I know that you're referring to a very specific tax change uh, there, and you're probably aware that we haven't changed our view on that in the nine days since I handed down the budget. Uh, but I do think uh, we should be looking for ways to make the tax system fairer, and we should be doing that so that we can fund the things that our society values, like education and public health. If you, you've been talking a lot about, you know, having foresight and the things you can't expect, knowing what you know now, looking at the downturn internationally, the impact of inflation, looking at fairness and intergenerational inequality, would you have committed to stage three tax cuts all the way to 200,000 with the cost it's going to take from, from, uh, from the budget if you knew what you knew now? Well, even better than that, Stan, I mean, when those tax cuts were presented to the parliament, uh, what we tried to do at the time was amend them. Uh, and we tried to amend them so that people on middle income. But now you want to deliver them. Well, your question was if we had our time again, would we do it differently? Now, knowing what you know now, can you, can you commit to it knowing what we know now? Well, they, they are in the budget uh, already. Uh, they come in in more than two budgets away. Uh, we've got more pressing priorities that we're working on. But your question was with the benefit of hindsight, I mean, when they were presented to the parliament, 
Uh, we said we should find a way to let tax relief flow to people on middle incomes uh, and not on some of those higher incomes. We tried to amend it, we were unsuccessful. And so we had to make a choice. Mm. Do we vote for the whole thing or do we try and knock it all over? I still believe that people on middle incomes in the context of bracket creep and all of the other kind of jargon that people are familiar with when we talk about tax, there is a case for tax relief for people. Yeah, but someone earning $200,000 a year and getting, you know, $9,000, almost $10,000 extra, is there a case for that? Well, we made it clear at the time uh, that we would have designed them differently at the beginning. Uh, they are now a feature of the budget. Uh, I have been up front with people and said that the cost of these tax cuts is rising mm. uh, and that uh, there is a broader conversation to have, not just to be had, not just in this area, about how we make the budget more sustainable. You sound like someone who's not really fully committed to these. You sound as if you really don't want to do it. You don't want to do it, do you? I, I wouldn't describe it that way. I wouldn't describe it that way. I'm trying to... I, I think in the, the discussion of the last few weeks, and I'm not going to pretend I wasn't part of this discussion, you know, I think inevitably when you've got $250 billion of tax cuts to come in, you've got all these structural pressures on the budget and you're working out your priorities, the, the country will want to hold those tax cuts up to the light. Uh, and I've been part of that conversation. Uh, but we haven't changed our view on them coming in. We had a crack at the time at making them different. We were unsuccessful. Uh, and they, as a consequence, are a feature of the budget. And there are other ways, there are other ways that we can make the tax system and the budget fairer and more sustainable. We'll come to that.